Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Lynch, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the IEEE Transactions on Robotics and Director of the Center for Robotics and Biosystems at Northwestern University. It's my pleasure to introduce today's panel, the fourth in a series on the grand challenge of robotic dexterity. The purpose of this series is to bring together thought leaders in robotic manipulation and to engage the broader community on topics such as the challenges to achieving advanced dexterity, high impact applications of robotic dexterity, and the potential economic and social impact of easier to program, more dexterous robots. This series is motivated by the recognition that progress in robotic dexterity has been slow, but also by the belief that the convergence of emerging technologies and, and the increasing interest in manipulation will lead to a rapid increase in capability. Today's panel is on the dexterity is on dexterity in industrial applications, particularly in logistics, and my main job is to introduce the moderator of the panel, Ken Goldberg. Before I do that, though, I want to plug the next panel. On April 19th at noon central time, moderated by Oliver Cromer, with panelists Rika Antonova, Chelsea Finn, Animesh Garg, and Andy Zeng on machine learning for robot manipulation and dexterity. Registration is live on our website. All panels are being recorded and will be available for viewing after the event. This panel will run for about 40 minutes, followed by questions from the audience. You can submit your questions at any time using Zoom's Q&A function. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Ken Goldberg. Ken is the William Floyd Distinguished Chair of Engineering at UC Berkeley and Chief Scientist of AMBI Robotics. Ken leads research in robotics and automation, in grasping, manipulation, and learning for applications in warehouses, industry, homes, agriculture, and robot-assisted surgery. He is Professor of Industrial Engineering and Operations Research at UC Berkeley, with appointments in electrical engineering, computer science, art practice, and UCSF radiation oncology. Ken is chair of the Berkeley AI Research Lab with 65 faculty and co-founder and editor-in-chief emeritus of the IEEE Transactions on Automation Science and Engineering. He has published 300 refereed papers, 10 U.S. patents, and was recognized as an NSF Presidential Faculty Fellow with the Joseph Engelberger Award, the IEEE Major Educational Innovation Award, and as an IEEE Fellow. To explore the applications and challenges of robot dexterity in industrial settings, Ken has invited three experts. I'll now pass it to Ken, who will say a little more about the topic and introduce the panelists. Great, thank you, Kevin. Ed, I wanna also thank the whole team at Northwestern for putting this together. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be a moderator of this, uh, of this particular webinar. I've been um, enjoying all the, the seminars you guys have been putting together. And we're going to take this one hour and we'll spend some time at the end to open it up to discussions. So anyone could submit questions at any time in the Q&A using the Q&A feature. Kevin will monitor these and then he'll pass along those questions and we'll, we'll get them out to the panelists. Now, I wanna say that we're, we're, there's many applications, industrial applications for robotics. It's in welding, spray painting, there's electronics assembly, but what we wanna focus on today is logistics, which I believe is a sweet spot for the recent advances in robots and robot learning. So let me define industrial dexterity for today as the challenge of moving of robots moving packages of varying shapes and sizes between conveyor belts, bins, and other devices. So the, the criteria that are often used in for this for this kind of work in, in commercial applications are rate, which is a, the successful picks per hour, the number of successful picks per hour, the range, the, the, the breadth of package shapes that can be handled, and the reliability, the percent of, of, of picks that are successful. Now, there are many experts around the world on these topics, and I am extremely happy to have the three that, that I consider particularly uh, outstanding here with us today. And they, I've had the great chance to, to work with each of them. Uh, full disclosure, Matt my, was my research advisor and really got me started in this business. Um, 
and I've worked with Lauren and with, with Jeff. And they each have contributed in major ways to robotics research and are now working to put research into practice. So I wanna welcome them to, to join now and I'm gonna do quick introductions. Lauren is the director of autonomy at uh, for autonomy for warehouse robotics at Boston Dynamics. And she leads the development of autonomous behaviors and new applications for Stretch, which is their newest robot. Lauren holds a PhD in robotics from Northwestern University and a BE from Dartmouth College. Prior to joining Boston Dynamics, she did a postdoc in my lab and led teams developing last mile delivery robots and autonomous construction and mining vehicles. Welcome, Lauren. Now, are you gonna show, will you show a little video right now or should we wait for that? Uh, let's wait for the, I think, first questions you got. Okay. All right, so I'll jump right into to Jeff then. He's the co-founder and CTO of Ambi Robotics. He leads the engineering and product management teams to develop AI-powered robotic systems that help people handle more in e-commerce logistics. He received his PhD in Berkeley and his, his dissertation was, the, was on the dexterity network known as DexNet, which was a framework for simulation to reality-based deep learning for robot grasping. His robot vision research has appeared and in the New York Times and was finalist for several awards, including best manipulation paper and best human robot interaction paper. Welcome, Jeff. And, uh, and then the last, but not very much not least is Matt Mason. He's the chief scientist at Berkshire Gray, professor emeritus at Carnegie Mellon. He did his PhD at MIT in 1982 and was director of Carnegie Mellon's Robotics Institute for 10 years. He's a fellow of the AAAI and the IEEE. He's won the System Development Foundation Prize, the IEEE RAS Pioneer Award, and the 2018 IEEE Technical Field Award in Robotics and Automation. Matt is somewhat legendary. Everybody knows him. And he, <laughs> look at that. He is, uh, he's, uh, he's, a, he's a wonderful, inspirational uh, uh, pioneer in our, in our field. And he has, he has really focused his entire career on robot manipulation. So welcome, Matt. All right, so let's jump in. Um, what I, I'd like to do is maybe ask each of you to, to, to give us a little context where you're coming from, what you're working on now. And we'll start, Lauren, do you wanna just give us a quick update? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Ken, for inviting me to join you today. Uh, super excited to be talking with all of you. Uh, as Ken mentioned, I work on Stretch, which is a mobile manipulation uh, robot designed for case pickling ap applications in warehouses. And I will uh, share a video here so you have an idea of what I'm talking about. All right, and I, excuse me if this is a little bit choppy. Uh, sharing video over Zoom is never easy. Uh, so the first application that we've developed for Stretch, which we've currently deployed at three customer sites, is unloading trucks and shipping containers. So as you can see here, Stretch moves boxes of various sizes and shapes, uh, up to 50 pounds is our sweet spot. We handle various textures uh, and integrate with different types of conveyors. Uh, Stretch is designed to fit into existing operations without a lot of infrastructure and provide you know, seamless user experiences for uh, operators. Uh, we're focusing on unloading trucks for now, which is only one piece of the really broad uh, world that is logistics, uh, but we're looking at additional applications that involve case picking, such as building orders, palletizing, depalletizing in the future. Uh, but truck unload is, is keeping us pretty busy for right now. Great. Thank you, Lauren. I just got a chance to see that at Promat, and it's quite an impressive design. Um, thank you. So if you want to share your screen, I'll ask Jeff to go next. Do you want to share anything uh, new from Ambi? Absolutely. And thank you, Ken, for having me here. It's, it's a pleasure to be speaking with all of you today. Um, so at Ambi Robotics, we are developing AI-powered robotic systems for helping warehouse workers handle more. Uh, so we're taking what were formerly you know, fully manual processes and equipping the workers who are in the warehouse with robots that they can operate such that they can handle the huge volume of 
packages coming through their building. And that's really where we specialize is in package handling for last mile deliveries. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. And here's a short video showing the overview. Of our looks like it's I have some lag. Uh, uh, this team that is, is specialized for sorting into USPS mail sacks as uh, packages go from uh, say Amazon to your front door, they're sorted into finer and finer localities, such as zip codes. And this machine takes in a bin of mixed packages, boxes, bags, envelopes, you name it. And it'll pick, scan, and sort them into USPS mail sacks that can go onto delivery trucks. Um, warehouse workers learn how to use this machine in just about a week, and they can usually operate about four of these machines at once, really up leveling their throughput um, and also helping them focus on what humans are best at uh, and upskilling them in the warehouse. So, really excited to share more about uh, Ambi Robotics and industrial dexterity with you today. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, Matt, how about you? What can you share with us? Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for all the kind words. Uh, let me see if I can share and show you something. Um, is that a slide? Yes. A slide, you can see them all right. Yeah, um, you don't really need to see this, but I, I was doing manipulation for a while before I uh, started into logistics. I'm just going to show you a few slides of this. This is some uh, work that was going on in good old fashioned dexterity, not industrial dexterity, I guess we're calling it. But this is the kind of thing you'd like to do with grippers, not just grasp things, but also uh, reposition them. So this is some very recent work in, uh, in the lab at CMU. But then, you know, a while back, I started working in logistics at Berkshire Gray, and I'm going to show you this one video. Uh, this is at one of the uh, top retailers in the world. I'm not supposed to say the name. And this is a uh, store replenishment operation. So it's kind of like order fulfillment, but the orders are going to the stores of this retailer. So this is their central sort of distribution center. So this is inventory coming in in bins. We have these robots that can uh, pick uh, pretty much anything. And so they put it in that bucket, that bucket zips back and forth and uh, deposits it in the correct um, destination, the, the correct bin. And then those bins roll out to, uh, to trucks and then those trucks will take them to the stores. And so that's, uh, um, and, and pretty much everything you're seeing there is Berkshire Gray. So the, the picking, which is kind of where it all starts, uh, but then this uh, sorting system automatically kicking out those uh, bins. Uh, everything's automated and everything uh, was part of one design so that you could sort of make it as efficient as possible. There's when the box has been closed, it's going off now to a truck. So there's four of them uh, working side by side. They've been there for quite a while now and they've picked zillions and zillions of things. And uh, so that's one of the systems to give you an idea. Great. All right. Thanks, Matt. Listen, let me just ask you quickly, uh, what, you know, logistics is a, is a big word and it's not that familiar to uh, roboticists. Can you give a quick summary of what is logistics in general? Yeah. So let me uh, un unshare because <laughs> I, I, uh, I have a slide for this. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, so what is logistics? There are producers, could be factories or farms or whatever, and they produce stuff. And then there's consumers, and they, they, they consume stuff, right? And so you need to get the stuff from the producers to the consumers, and we have this big network in between. And so now, if you just did the simplest thing and said, oh, I, I'm the factory, I just made a mint, I want to send it to, to Ken, you know, how much is that going to cost me, you know, a courier or whatever, it's a lot. So what you want to do is ship a whole bunch of mints at once, right? So you want to fill up a whole big container ship with mints and, and send that so that you can divide the cost by the number of units in, in the thing. Now, to do that efficiently, what you've got to do is, um, uh, oh, I didn't actually, this isn't actually, hang on one sec, find that little arrow. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. 
Is that working? You got a new slide there? Uh, not yet. It's probably coming. When you said mint, I, I thought you were talking about the like the the, the Philadelphia mint, and you're going to send gold, send me a gold bar. So I did something wrong here. It says, uh, "Oh, I send you click on resume share." Somehow I paused sharing. Can you see a slide now? Mm, no, but I think it'd be good if you could just sort of talk us through it. Okay, I'm going to try it one more time, and then if that doesn't work, that's fine. Um, no. Okay, uh, I hear you. I'm going to give up here at any moment. That's it. I give up. So um, in order to do this efficiently, uh, what mm -hmm. you have to have, right, is you don't just put all the mints in one big container you're going to have a hierarchy of containers. And so, um, I, you know, this is still screwed up, I'm sorry. Okay, you're gonna have a hierarchy of containers. So you, inside a shipping container or a truck, which is just a big box on wheels, you have smaller boxes, or in this case, pallets, right? And then mm -hmm. on the pallet, you've got cases. And then inside the cases, you've got boxes. And then inside the boxes, you've got what we often call each is that right the thing you pick off the supermarket store is called sometimes an each okay so there's this this hierarchy of containers and the whole reason that this thing can be so efficient that these trucks can all be loaded all the time is because you try and keep uh you try and stay at the top of that level right you try mm -hmm. and stay at the container level or the pallet level so you'll move pallet from one truck to another when you're sorting pallets but you won't unload the pallets to cases unless you have to, right? So you don't have a bare mint floating around in this network until the consumer takes it off the shelf. So that's the way I see logistics, right? It's a big network, a big transportation network. You've got this hierarchy of containers. And the way it works now is that the, you know, the, the highest levels of containers are standardized. So they're easy to move around. The uh, containers, the trucks, they're easy to move around. If you get to cases, still pretty easy. Pallets, still pretty easy. You got pallet jacks, right? It's all standardized. The lower you get in that, the less standardized until you get down to each. Is, and then there's very little standardization. And that's some of the challenges we're seeing right now. So I don't know. Does that, does that help? Yeah, definitely. I like that. So think of that as a hierarchy. One of the things I want to um, ask you also, Matt, is is that you I, I you know you were really the wrote the book and and generated the key theorem on ro on robot pushing, and you've um, you've you've really showed me uh, the value of why that's complex and interesting, but uh, you've switched to pulling. <laughs> so uh, what's the what's the issue? How, why why suction cups? Um. Yeah, that's that's interesting. The the main thing about suction cups. So so the thing that I think we didn't realize about uh, about manipulation until we started working in logistics is just how big a problem clutter is. Okay, so you know we used to do things where you're picking a block off of a table and it's you know it's just isolated. You have no trouble getting your fingers around it. And then we would say, oh, it's a high clutter situation. You've got some other stuff around it. But in mm -hmm. logistics, people pack things as tight as they can. So it's like cigars in a cigar box now all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so uh, it's hard to get your fingers around things. Uh, if you have a way to do it with just one point of contact instead of two or three or five, then the clutter is just not as big a problem. So I think that's that's the number one great thing about suction cups. Okay, good. And and we felt pleasantly we learned that there's actually quite a lot of nuance to suction cups. Uh, the, there's a sort of conventional wisdom that that's easy, but it's actually not. And getting that right is really yeah. really subtle and interesting. Lauren, maybe you, you can say something. A nice paper. You guys wrote a nice paper on uh, modeling. <laughs> stuff, so I wasn't going to say that, but but there is. I think there's a lot more to be done there, and a few more PhD dissertations. So if anyone's interested in in really diving in deeper to suction cups, there's a lot there. Um, Lauren, what about Boston Dynamics? You guys are um, targeting unloading of cuboidal boxes, it seems. Um, these are six-sided but varying dimensions. Can you say more about what's challenging about that in particular and why more research might be needed? Yeah, we uh, Ken and I talked about this a little bit before this panel, and I, I 
pulled a quote for one of our recent YouTube, YouTube videos, which was, I find it crazy that box moving robots aren't common yet. It looks so easy, so simple, needs no fancy AI. Uh, and you know, even though we're moving cuboid boxes, there's a lot that is difficult to do quickly and reliably. Um, there's, there's sort of dimensions that get really challenging. Uh, so Matt mentioned one point of contact making, we also use a suction cup gripper. Uh, one point of contact makes things simpler, but you need enough contact to be able to, we lift boxes up to 50 pounds. So you need a decent amount of contact to actually be able to grasp. And sometimes you get this sort of adversarial dimensions like pizza shaped boxes, right? Where you have uh, just a really small amount of surface area you can grasp and then a lot of torque that makes it hard to move things. Uh, you mentioned the way boxes are stacked uh, as well, Matt. That's the challenge if boxes are packed in there, if they are overlapping in ways that are difficult to observe, it's really challenging. Uh, the boxes themselves can be damaged or low quality uh, or crushed, which makes it difficult to grasp reliably uh, with suction porous surfaces, uh, aren't really something you can always grasp reliably. Um, and we also handle boxes that are pretty heavy. So you have to think about things like dynamics when you're swinging a 50 pound box around. Um, we also think about things like uh, place orientation really matters to a lot of customers for certain reasons. Barcodes might need to be oriented or they have downstream systems. So you're not only planning you know, how you grasp a relatively simple looking box, but you're thinking there's sort of a multi-stage uh, planning process that you're thinking through because there's all this downstream stuff, even for the most simple sort of shapes you can be handling. So there, there's a lot of fun problems. Good. Yeah, Lauren, I think also that, you know, the, the contents make the shift inside a box, that mm -hmm. you know, moving center of grass, that's an issue. If a box, a box gets wet in any way, I would imagine that's really tricky because you can't suction on, you know, suction doesn't work. It's just starts Yeah, to we, like... we had, we, we've encountered uh, trucks that have like boxes of wet jeans, right? It's like the worst, the worst case. The boxes, they rip, they're poorly taped, they're wet, and there's, there's not much you can do. Good. Yeah, I think what's interesting is how many nuances there are once you get out and actually start doing this. Um, Jeff, can you tell us you 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 did this work on on Dexnet that was really pioneering um, application of deep learning to uh, to bin picking in particular, and you've extended this in many directions. One of them is not only picking but placing. And can you talk about that? Why that's important? And um, again, where new research might be might be needed. Absolutely. So we sort into uh, mail bags. That's one thing we think about a lot. And as Matt mentioned, there's a lot of different types of containers that you can start to sort each of their packages into. You have cardboard boxes, you have um, bubble mailers are really common. Those Amazon blue and white packages we all know, uh, poly bags and so on. So orienting items to place into those containers is actually a big challenge. Um, especially because we're not dealing with just rigid items, but a huge percentage of what's being shipped is actually a deformable item. Um, the majority of packages are not boxes, but poly bags, at least what we handle in the, the small parcel world. So what does that mean for placement? Well, there's a, a few different challenges. One is if, if you have a rigid item, figuring out how to orient it to place it such that it might slide through the opening of a bag, that creates some challenges given that you have suction cup, you're not able to re-grasp an item very quickly. So you need to figure out how to orient it. And sometimes the placement plan can be coupled with the pick. You wanna pick up an item in a way such that you can, in the future, place it into a, a given location. And now when you get into two deformable items, there are a lot of challenges around how you get that deformable item to go where we want it to go. If we're holding it with a suction cup and it's dangling below, it might be swinging to the sides. And we think a lot about how to uh, do what um, I've heard called extrinsic dexterity. So how do we use the external world to actually stabilize the item and kind of make it go where we want it to go? So we might slide a bag across a ramp or drag it um, onto something in order to kind of fit it into a given location. And there's a lot of work left to be done just for that, for one item going into one, say, predefined 3D region or, or 2D opening fitting through that. And that's just really the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we can also think a lot about how do you pack these items together? So what if I need to fill a box to 80% density with these 10 random items? How do we actually orient them? There's this really 
complex and interesting Tetris problem with physical items um, that uh, I think is a long way from being solved and is a huge opportunity for future research. Yes, that's great. You know, it's interesting, the, te the, the Tetris, because I think there's a competition every year from uh, grocery, uh, from grocery baggers, and they, they can sort of compete in how well they can pack the groceries. And uh, I have to check into that because I think it'd be fun to watch. And, and I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing there's still a good gap between the best humans and uh, the best robots so far. Um, okay, great. So um, I, I want to say I had the chance to visit the your your all your your booths at the Promat Conference uh, uh, Expo in Chicago last week, and I have to note it's kind of a little um, just as an aside. Uh, there was a, a moment when I I, I saw Matt and I, I spoke with Matt and um, and Mark Raybert, who I think is on uh, the uh, on this um, uh, webinar and. Um, and I was joking because it was, it, who would have thought uh, when we were all working together at uh, Carnegie Mellon on the fourth floor, or sorry, yeah, Carnegie Mellon at the fourth floor, that uh, we'd all be in the same business 40 years later. <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, it's really, it is an exciting business. And there's many others out there who are competing. I'm very happy to hear, to, to see this. I think it's, there's, a, there's a, so much work to be done. And uh, so it's not a winner take all kind of industry. There's so many different um, uh, applications. So I think there's an opportunity for many groups to thrive. One of the criteria, um, or let's come back to the issue of criteria, because there's um, there, there's a well-known criteria of rate, range, and reliability I mentioned earlier. And I'm curious how each of you think about these criteria and how they're maybe independent or correlated, and what other criteria that you found to be um, important in industry. So maybe, um, Matt, do you want to go first? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, well, those are important criteria. And uh, uh, when you're doing an application, when you're working with a customer, uh, then, of course, you find all kinds of criteria that you didn't know you were going to be worrying about. Uh, trying to find another thing that's as pithy as, uh, as those three. Uh, the thing that comes to mind for me is uh, context. Uh, so, um, you know, there's an awful lot of different things in the world. So if you're just worrying about what things can I pick up, that's what you're calling range, you know, that's pretty hard to grapple with. Uh, but if you ask yourself, well, how many different arrangements of interfering objects are there? Okay, that's a combinatorically larger set of things to worry about, right? So, you know, I referenced the cigar box problem before. It's hard to get the first cigar out of the box and a lot harder than it is to get the last out. Um, but, uh, you know, what happens when you start looking at random assortments of things, you know, stuff that is just thrown into an inventory bin all mixed up? You know, what is it that makes it hard? How are you going to test against that? How do you, what metrics do you have, right? That's, that I think is a, uh, uh, a, a very real challenge. I, I think it's like the biggest difference between what we used to work on in, in the labs and, and the reality that we're facing now. And it's also just very, very difficult to uh, sort of wrap your head around it. Hmm. Good. Yeah, I remember when the first time uh, we talked to a client and they, they gave us a, pa the, the, you know, a pallet, but everything was tightly packed. And I yeah. just had never never considered that as a as a bin picking uh, aspect but that's very common okay good um lauren how about you um yeah i think i think something that's that's always really interesting is how tightly connected you mentioned rate range and reliability they uh compete with each other in a lot of ways so oftentimes the faster we go the more you might you know reliability might go down you might drop more boxes uh range similarly certain types of boxes we can move really fast we're really reliable once we sort of get a little bit outside of our comfort zone we might need to slow down in order to not drop boxes um we also i think within reliability there's there's a lot of different we think about reliability in a few different ways so there's sort of like you know classic kind of hardware reliability are there system faults that stop operation, uh, things like that, uh, dropping boxes. But more importantly is more importantly than drop boxes is actually user intervention rate. So it's 
in a lot of cases, depending on the product, totally fine if you drop things as long as you don't require a lot of operators operators to intervene a lot. So we've built in a lot of recovery behaviors so that when we do drop boxes, the robot will pick them up. Uh, sometimes it still needs help, but the more we can minimize disrupting other things going on in an operation uh, by cleaning up our own messes, even if it means we move a little bit slower, uh, that's still a win. Good. I like that. That's a. It's a really good point. Sometimes, um, you know, it's mean time between failure or uptime, right? Is a, is very important. And um, yeah, no, I think that 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 seems to be. You know, you don't want to sh shut down the whole facility when one one thing breaks. We're also lucky, I think, in this business that unlike the self driving car business, <laughs> where we, there's a lot more tolerance for errors, and uh, and they're 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 inevitable in some in, in to some degree. Jeff, um, how about you? Could you what what do you think in terms of other other you know criteria? Yeah, first I'll second what Lauren just said about the user intervention. That's a really important aspect of reliability. Uh, we think about quite a lot, and uh, there's there's different aspects to it that even include, you know, how how long does it take for you to get a user to intervene? once an intervention is needed. There, there's a lot of nuance to that that uh, certainly I didn't think a lot about in the lab. But I'll, I'll throw in another one, which is we think a lot about sort accuracy. So if we miss sort of package, then uh, downstream a client might not get it when they thought were, they were gonna get it. It might go to the wrong facility, end up on the wrong truck. And this can happen uh, most commonly from picking up more than one item and the robot uh, not recognizing that and sorting those multiple items to all, all to the same bin. And this is, it, it's an interesting thing because I remember back in the lab when we used to get double picks, we would think of it as a bonus, you know, you get an extra item, but, but in reality in, in the industry, it's uh, quite a big problem. And we have to meet service level agreements on the sort accuracy of our machines and think a lot about systems for detecting potential missorts before they happen. And of course, aborting those, uh, recycling them back into the input so there's not a human intervention or, or things of that nature. Good. Yeah, I know that's a great one. I just actually, um, there was a, one of Peter Beale's students just uh, is working on a paper on, on reducing double sorts or double picks. And it, it is interesting because you don't think about it. Um, but yeah, it, it, if you get an extra pack, you know, thing when you make an order and you get an, ex an extra product, that's great for you. But that means that there's some inconsistency in the warehouse uh, system and someone else is not going to get their product somewhere down the road. That also just made me think, so, so customers also really care about metrics. So not just performing well, but being able to report reliably on your own reliability is something that's also... Uh, has its own challenges that I don't think I really thought about before Interesting. getting into industry. Well, you know, so it's, it's another thing about double picks. Um, you know, if you watch what, humans being very, very efficient and uh, comparing them with robot performance, one thing humans will do is if somebody has ordered, you know, three of something, they'll fulfill all three of those at once. They'll deliberately pick them up. So right now, you know, we're, we're worrying about avoiding double picks, but you know, tomorrow we're going to be worrying about producing them deliberately. And and triple that's picks. a really good point. It's to some extent it's a placement problem, right? We, if we if the robot picks up three of the suction cup, it can't put down just one at a time, uh, or at least not yet. It can if you have individually actuated the suction cup propers. Just saying. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> let's talk about, let's talk about that okay so that's I, I want to circle back to that because this is what comes back to why suction is interesting so generally you're not just talking about one suction cup you're talking about a matrix of suction cups i think that's true for all three of you and they're individually addressable so that means that you have to make these decisions about which ones to actuate right actually we we, we generally don't use i mean we do a lot of different things but our our sort of number one, each picking thing does not have uh, an array of suction cups. Oh, interesting. Okay, um, but that is a that is a nice another nice opportunity for a research project is really identifying and optimizing the, which cups to activate. Activate. Um, let me add one more because uh, you know it's a, kind of an elephant in the room, but and also has an R. It's an R word for the alliteration of rate range reliability. But let me add ROI. 
right? That that is one that we often don't talk about in in research, but um, huge in in industry. Everybody, in fact, they don't really care about the fancy technology, right? I mean, they don't care what algorithms or AI you got in there. Ultimately, it's like, what's the ROI? <laughs> So would you guys find that to be the case, or or do you find that customers are impressed by um, the, the the technology per se? Uh, I think the ROI is the huge. case. Yeah, yeah. Of course, they they need you know they're trying to decide whether to to give you their money or not, right? So return on investment, definitely. Okay, good. All right. Well, let me ask this. Um, since we're about just to follow up on range. Um. I'm curious about where this comes back to the point Lauren was making about boxes, but for all of you, what are some of the, the real adversarial objects um, that you faced or, or situations for grasping where, um, you know, the objects might be transparent, um, deformable, um, even dynamic, like I think grasping a fish has got to be one of the hardest things <laughs> to, to achieve. Um, a, a fish that doesn't want to be grasped. I mean, I'm talking about a living fish. Um, <laughs> So what is what is hard? What are some hard cases that that still are wide open for grasping? I mean, I'd rather talk about the the, the very very challenging case that got us started, which was you know that vacuum ordinarily cannot pick up anything if it can't get a seal, and mm -hmm. so you know one of the videos I I didn't show uh, is showing it uh, you know our gripper picking porous things even even a bath sponge. Mm -hmm. um plastic bags people have talked about that's also a, a challenge um they peel off in a certain way it's hard to get a good grip but uh you know that's those are challenges are behind us now uh the one still in front of us i don't know i'll let somebody else talk yeah just throwing some others in there um there's there's definitely interesting things that can happen with heavier items and lauren may experience this more than i do but Boxes, if they're very heavy and they're not taped adequately, it can be very nuanced to how to grab them. If you grab them, say on the shipping label, the shipping label might just rip off and you don't have the box in your hand anymore. And then you have lost identification of that box or sometimes the boxes will open up and, and boxes that can open that are not sealed or not sealed adequately, I think are still a, an interesting sort of challenge. How do you recognize that and then grasp them appropriately um so that's one that comes to mind that's a great one you know because we're sorry go ahead Laura. go ahead oh, i was gonna say i think that's 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 a really interesting area for research is being able to detect when you're not going to be able to grasp things like humans will just handle this right if you see a box and the tape is a little loose on the top or it's sagging on one side you'll you'll reach around you'll grab the other and adapt but it's hard it's hard to automate right and then once you do um, some box bursts open, then you have a big issue, right? Because now you've really got your suction cups get clogged and everything gets, you know, spilled and you got a lot of little particles to clean out. Okay, so yes, we have that situation. Um, so listen, I, we have a great uh, group of people out, out in, the, uh, in the audience here, over a hundred. And I see some names that I recognize like uh, Ken Salisbury, um, Mike Peshkin, John Craig, other um, other pioneers in this field. I'm curious who has questions that um, that you can you can give us and we'll I'll share with the um, with the with the panelists. Um, there's some really great ones coming in now. And um, I'm curious um, here. Let me start with this just quickly. What what innovations do you guys see in the last few years that have really changed uh, the, this this field, this subfield of, of industrial dexterity? In other words, in, has it been in simulation, sensing, in control algorithms or motors? Uh, what what do you see has been is, is important or things to, that you're excited about? I'm I'm happy to jump in first. I, two that I'm very excited about are the uh, innovations in artificial intelligence and deep learning, I guess, is uh, a decade old now, arguably, uh, or at least since the big ImageNet result. But I think the innovations that have really sparked robotic picking and placing um, are starting to come to maturity more in the last five years, certainly. Um, I know that before COVID, a lot of folks were considering this kind of robotic each picking more as a, an experiment or an interesting 
future innovation. And now you were talking about Promat earlier, people take it very seriously and are looking to, to buy these things for real. Um, and another, I would argue, is in um, end of arm tooling. While suction cups have been around for a long time, I've seen a lot of innovations recently around how do you actually combine pieces that maybe we already had to have, say, the ability to actuate individual suction cups that are specialized for different material types. Mm -hmm. um, and we've certainly leveraged a lot of rapid prototyping, which comes from the world of 3D printing, uh, also not that old, in order to figure out good gripper designs that are highly reliable um, and can deal with compliance when they grasp items. So those are two that come to mind for me. Hmm. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. That's great. Um, Matt, do you, Lauren, do you have any other additions that are that you're that you feel have, are changing this field, make it more feasible to 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 actually deliver these robots at a cost effective? Um, I, mean, I, I think demand. Jeff mentioned COVID, but like demand has really gone up for logistics. Right. We keep hearing about all of these bottlenecks. So. Uh, all of our customers talk about not being able to hire and keep workers. It's a it's a hard job. It's a seasonal job. Uh, so so you know demand is driving a lot here. Um, I'll also say this is not my specialty, but I, I think advances in compute sensors, batteries, just sort of like make the reliability and cost of robotic systems just seem like they just get better and better. So um, and like just mentioned, I think. Uh, advances in, in sort of like reliable 2D, 3D perception is huge for, mm -hmm. for actually working in the wild as opposed to like a lab experiment, so. Great, great. Thank you, Lauren. Um, Matt, do you have anything to add? I, I think I, I, I like what Lauren said. I think I just want to uh, Reinforce it. Uh, one thing I've been amazed at. I mean, you know, so I was a specialist in in manipulation. I wasn't paying. Uh, you know, I didn't know what was going on in software engineering generally, or in other areas in engineering. And just watching the engineering teams putting these systems together, I've been amazed at sort of how, you know, a, across the board, you see progress. We're building systems that are way more complex than I think could have been done just a few years ago. The user interfaces are amazing. The software quality assurance, the manufacturing systems, all of that is uh, uh, quite quite advanced. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that, that, that Lauren mentioned was the uh, demand. And uh, one thing that I, I don't think has been mentioned in this webinar is that the surprising thing to me if you look at e-commerce, the penetration and retail of, of e-commerce is still only like 18 or 20 percent. So, you know, we're still at the leading edge of this. I think it's kind of a historic shift in labor where the consumers don't want to do the picking themselves at the store. As I said, they, they, they're, they're pushing that labor off on the warehouses. As Lauren says, they have a very hard time uh, getting the people to do that. And yet, you know, we're just getting started. So. Um, really automation, this seems to be not an option, but a necessity now. Mm. So let me follow up on that a little bit, which is the, 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 the idea of data. And you're talking about the algorithms, you know, in, in, in so much of deep learning, it's, it's all about the data. And I'm curious if, you know, this seems to be, is this important for you? And, you know, do, do, do in turn, does that mean that you're starting to use the cloud for processing? In, in new ways because traditionally the, the, the network, the cloud network has only been minimally used for, for robotics. And I'm curious if you see that as, as increasing with, the, with this massive inflow of data today. Maybe Jeff, you could take that off, lead that off. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, data is critical to robots in these warehouse operations. There's no doubt about it. Lauren mentioned earlier the ability to you know, show reliable metrics to the customer, and that is very important. And the cloud is is paramount to, to doing that. We have big cloud storage, and and we try to create useful views of that data for um, customers. You know, so they can have real time views into their warehouses that sometimes they they haven't had before because this is a, a slow moving industry. Sometimes they're built on software systems from the early two thousands, and so being able to just bring modern SaaS to the table can make a big difference for these users. 
Uh, but it's also huge for the kind of uh, exciting machine learning research that you can do once you have, you know, say hundreds of robots in the field, there's streaming all kinds of data up to the cloud. We can select relevant data points to retrain AI models on, ship those back to the robots, do things like A-B test different models um, and see which ones are actually working well in practice instead of just evaluating on a held out data set that you know, lives offline. So there's a lot of interesting things that uh, the cloud opens up here. Great, thank you, Jeff. Lauren and Matt, do you have anything to add? Okay. I'd say like different customers have different requirements on like whether you can take their data on-prem, off-prem. So there's a lot of, of nuance there in software engineering. And, and Jeff mentioned like making local decisions. Do you are you tuning models for specific customers or not? Um, so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of of management and software engineering and nuance there that's not just uh, how well you tune your models that gets really interesting. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I, I just uh, was talking to someone at Siemens, and they're saying that this is they're they're moving really into this direction that they're all their controllers are going to be connected to the cloud, and it's really you know for years it was very difficult. People didn't want there were really a lot of fear about security, et cetera. But it's shape that's changing, and especially because you have access to a lot of compute in the cloud that you don't necessarily want to have in the factories. So you have GPUs and other um, uh, uh, TPUs and other things you can access. Okay, good. Um, let me come. There, you mentioned also um, the human in in the loop here, Lauren. And um, so a question came up about: Well, what are we getting close to human level um, dexterity here, or have we surpassed it? And what is the role for the for the worker? Is you know, there's always there, there is a, a real legitimate concern about: Is this going to put, you know, is create massive unemployment? And um, and for workers fearing for their jobs, can can each of you address that? I think I'll just uh, say what I said before. I, I you know the, the, what's different. I mean, if you look at the industrial revolution, right? That was the machines coming and taking jobs away from people that were happy doing those jobs, and then they moved to the city and you know started uh, you know being greeters at Walmart or something. I don't know. And then you know the. Uh, the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, both had that character. This revolution, I mean, it's probably not on the same scale, but it's also different in character, right? The people that say they don't want to do, the, it's not the machines taking the job, taking the work away from people that want to do it. It's the people that were doing it, the consumers saying, I don't want to pick my own orders in the store anymore, right? And they're, they don't want the work and they're pushing it to the warehouses and the warehouses don't have enough people. And they, know, and they won't, for the foreseeable future, be able to hire enough people. So uh, in many areas of robotics, this is a, a very touchy problem, but I don't really think it is that, uh, that, that kind of thing in logistics. Okay. Truck drivers, truck drivers could be different, but in warehouse workers, I don't think it is. Well, I don't think we're going to see automated trucks for a long time, my own view, but um, <laughs> uh, certainly not on the, on the off, off the freeway. But um, Jeff, how about you? What, what is your thought about the, the jobs aspect and the workers? Yeah, I, I agree with what Matt said. Just to underscore the point, we've talked with customers that have nine out of 10 workers leave a full time job within a year. So that means they're basically a revolving door. People don't want to do these warehouse jobs where as demand is growing and it's harder and harder to hire people, that means that they're under more and more pressure to move quickly. And, and these sorts of jobs um, are very repetitive and that's not just you know boring but it, or just tedious. It's, it's something that hurts your body. It's something that will you know, damage your shoulders or your back over time. Um, and that's why there's a large number of people who will walk out on a lunch break um, within their very first few weeks. So um, what our philosophy is, uh, is to empower the workers who are there to be upskilled and, and work with these robots um, to help these warehouses handle the volume that's coming in and help the workers you know, do more of what they're good at uh, and in a sustainable fashion. So that brings in a lot of interesting opportunities for user interface design, and arguably it's a human-robot interaction problem as well, uh, perhaps slightly different than 
you know, a robot literally handing a person a package, that could happen someday as well. But there is a lot of human robot interaction that has to happen in order for these things to function very well. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that uh, just Matt mentioned the uh, industrial revolution. I mean, in, in the early days, there was a lot of sabotage, right, of of, um, it, of machines. And one thing that we know is that if you put a robot system in a, in a warehouse and you're really, you know, oblivious to the workers, um, there's a lot of things that can go wrong, right? And so one of the things I, I, I'm curious about... Uh, maybe Jeff, you can address, but how do you, how do you talk with workers when you're installing a system like this? Is that a factor for you? Absolutely. Uh, we, we try to understand uh, what they're excited about, how they want to use the machine. Um, you know, what are they concerned about? What do they think will work well? And we spend a lot of effort on training programs. So we have a robot operator university, as we call it, where we train workers within a week to use these systems. And then they're up and running and they can operate, uh, say, four machines at once, um, which is Im uh, improving the number of packages they are responsible for sorting by about four or five X. Um, and again, that's within about a week or two weeks worth of training. So it's, it's very important to talk with the workers, understand them and uh, we hear a lot from them and getting great feedback too. How do we improve the products? Um, and just again, to underscore how much uh, they also want to work with the robots. We, when our robots sometimes go down and, and they do, um, the workers will sometimes come to us and, and be asking us, when is the robot gonna come back up? When is the robot gonna come back up? Because they want it to be running. It's something they consider you know, part of their existence in the job now. Mm -hmm. Great. So might, maybe we could add another R to our list of criteria, which might be uh, receptivity, uh, right? How 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 receptive is your system uh, for ro for workers? Okay, great. So we only have a few minutes left, unfortunately. Uh, I would love to continue this, but um, but let me ask. I, there's two questions, and you can choose which one you want to answer, but they're both kind of related. One is really about uh, research and what advice you would have for researchers that are still in, in academia, specifically um, students or, or faculty that, you know, what would, what would be some interesting areas that you would recommend that they might want to look into? And then the other one is the big, the other big elephant, which is ChatGPT and generative AI, which has been taking the world by storm in every single way. And um, I'm just curious if that has this, this sort of transformer model or new advances in diffusion models have an implications for, for, for logistics and, and, and industrial dexterity. So I'll start with you, Lauren. You can pick either one of those two in the last four or five minutes we have left. Uh, yeah, so for, for research, I would say, you know, we, we've talked a lot about uh, manipulating deformable objects or deep learning, reinforcement learning. We do still use a lot of classical control and optimization, right? So like impedance control, trajectory optimization, inverse kinematics, like all of this stuff really matters. Uh, we also have a mobile base, so like, slam improvements, like route planning, mission planning, uh, all of that stuff is still really important. And there's always more to do there to optimize. So uh, you don't have to just look at the, the, the trendy stuff we're talking about either. Um, Great. Okay, thanks, Lauren. And actually, um, so I'll turn over to Matt and Jeff. And I'm curious, one, one thing maybe you could address also is there's a lot of research in soft grippers. And I'm curious if you could say anything about where you see opportunities there as well as other research. Matt? Yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna skip the chat GPT issue and talk about suction cups. I, I think it's interesting when people uh, say, well, you know, there are limitations of suction cups and, you know, they wanna know what, what it is that they can't do. And they have in mind what a hand can do based on their own experience. And they wanna compare that with a, a suction cup, which has no degrees of freedom. You know, if you turn the suction off, it's a finger, right? And they want to compare that with this thing. And why are they not thinking, why are we, I should say, why are we not thinking uh, about a number of other opportunities? So why do we want to compare the zero degree of freedom thing that happens to have suction with the like 20 degree of freedom thing here and, and, and worry about the differences. So does that mean maybe, th maybe these fingers should have suction cups on them too? Uh, maybe occasionally two different robots with suction cups could interact in a useful way. 
Um, maybe you have something that's got two fingers and has degrees of freedom and can also apply suction. I mean, suction is, is it, 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 it doesn't hurt you, right? I mean, the difference between a finger and a suction cup is that a finger can apply forces in that direction and tangential forces to some extent, and a suction cup can apply forces in both directions. So if you turn the suction off, you've got a finger, right? And so, and so I'm, I'm always, I'm always confused and a little bit, uh, you know, I'm, I'm perplexed. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think suction cups, people just see suction cups as being a mundane and industrial thing. And they see the future being something that looks, that looks more like a human. And I think we're missing a huge, a huge uh, set of possibilities there. It's oh, like the by the way, you say soft robotics. <laughs> if you want to see a soft finger, go look at a suction cup, right? They've got the, the compliance of the cup itself, as you know very well. And well, often I think, have that, uh, uh, what do you call well, the bellows. Yeah, well, I mean, I think there's a there's a, some some conjectures yeah, in various science fiction that, you know, um, that that uh, uh, the, the maybe that the world will ultimately be taken over by uh, by by giant octopi and squid who've been waiting down there quietly, but they've know they've been knowing this for years, right? Um, they're very good at it. Um, listen, we, we only have a couple minutes left. The warehouse work. <laughs> uh, Jeff, what about you? What what would you say? Yeah, quickly, uh, I want to reiterate i think there's huge opportunities for placement and re-grasping research especially with manipulators that are working well in industry like suction cups uh, that matt uh, was just mentioning um i'll take a stab at the chat gpt question so it doesn't go unanswered there's opportunities certainly in high level planning so things of the form of the robot needs to pick then scan then place then re-pick then uh try to find this object those sort of things, uh, there's a lot of great research already being done, and I think there's a long way left to go. And um, I think there's also interesting opportunities in applying to other domains. Uh, Ken, you and I were talking about using it, for example, in motion planning. If you have a sequence of, say, joints and joint velocities, um, can you predict what the next several should be? Uh, it's sort of similar to the way Chad GPT fills in words. Perhaps there's an opportunity there, and I think there's many more that uh, we don't have time for today. Excellent. All right. Well, I haven't asked this question of ChatGPT itself yet, but um, but we'll have to do that. All right. Listen. Thank you so much, you guys. It was such a pleasure. I you exceeded ex expectations amazingly, and I, I really appreciate all of you. I'll turn it over to you, Kevin. All right. Thanks, Ken, and to our panelists, Jeff, Matt, and Lauren, for that fascinating discussion on logistics, and to you, the audience, for your active engagement. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all of your questions. Uh, but we'd appreciate it if you would sh share feedback on today's panel by, by filling out the survey that will be sent to you. Uh, also, I want to uh, plug one more time the next conversation we'll be having on machine learning for robot manipulation and dexterity, moderated by Oliver Cromer with panelists Rika Antonova, Chelsea Finn, Animesh Garg, and Andy Zhang. Registration is now open, and uh, I hope to see you there. Thanks again for joining us today, and thanks, everyone.